So, Richard, thanks so much for taking time to be here. You have welcome. operated some huge websites, as you like to say. And I had more fun going through and researching for this conversation because you've held so many different responsibilities at so many different levels of scale. And I wanted to start off and ask you how you got into what you're doing and how you arrived at Slack and, and give us a little sense for your journey. Sure. Well, it's, it's a pleasure to be talking with you as always, Elliot. We've, uh, we've gotten to know each other through the startup world and, and looking back on all the, the experiences that I've had. And, and they, they begin, honestly, with, with needing to get a job in high school and having a, a fascination with, with computers above basically everything else. And so I worked for my schools and, and, and it kind of snowballed from there into computer engineering degrees and a lucky break that got me an internship at Yahoo in 2006, that brief window when Yahoo was cool again for a little while. And, and ultimately there was, was where I met Cal Henderson and Stuart Butterfield. And so after a meandering path through several startups like OpenDNS and Square, I had several opportunities to learn what I liked. And what I liked was plumbing. It was the, the stuff that was actually the same depending, or the same through any of these companies, not dependent on what the domain of, of the product was. It was the infrastructure that was necessary to make anything thrive on the internet. And I had a top, an opportunity to join Cal and Stewart again at Slack as the first director of operations. And it was an opportunity that, that was perfect because I knew those people and I knew that I worked well with them. I knew that the challenge was already large and growing. The company had, had I think, about 35,000 simultaneously connected users. That was the metric that we, we cared about in operations engineering. About 35,000 when I joined. And when I left, it was more than 10 million. So wow. we, we got to see a lot of things break as our assumptions needed to change. Um, but the, the opportunity to work with Cal and Stewart again was, was really what drew me to Slack. And the experience at OpenDNS and Square and Vettable and companies like that, plus building open source software and attempting to start a company on that, all of those experiences added up to being ready enough for the job at Slack and, and certainly... I could never have been totally ready for it. So those six years taught me more easily than the other half of my career combined. Now, ready enough is an interesting way to phrase uh, that status, right? Going into Slack. Can you tell us a little bit about how big was the team? What resources did you walk into and, and what were you looking at when it came to your role? Call it day one, you walk in the office. Sure. So, so I joined when there were around 20 employees, well after the, the shutdown of Glitch the Game and the public unveiling of, of Slack, the product that they were building with the remains of their initial investment. And in fact, I joined at the, the moment when there was investment in Slack. And so the, the company was well capitalized. We were in a position to do what we needed to do to grow and capture this market of a new kind of product that, that people were starting to realize was an advantage to doing business. And I came in as the director of operations with one report. Uh, it was a team of two of us and grew from there. And by the time I, I left management about three and a half years later, it was a team of about 40 people. And uh, in those early days, we didn't have constraints on, on resources like money and compute capacity and things like that. We were all hosted in AWS. So a lot of the traditional constraints that are placed on operations engineering teams, we didn't have. Instead, what we had was exponential growth. And even in the small, exponential growth is tough to deal with. And so we felt constantly behind the eight ball in every way from, from capacity to provide the service, capacity to support our engineers, capacity to support our customers. So you ask about our first day and, and on the first day, that I was at the office. I come in and Cal, the CTO says, I'm so glad you're here. We have a meeting with auditors today. And in previous jobs, I had bootstrapped the compliance program and worked with the regulators in the UK that regulate online gambling. I had learned how compliance works and how it relates to security, uh, though I learned so much more about that 
subsequently at Slack. But I was, I was there to bootstrap the compliance program because Slack was a, co a company that, that was meant to host and, and make useful all of a company's communications, all of their, their dirty laundry, their internal secrets, their architecture, their business practices, and companies rightly want to protect that. And one of the ways that, that companies ensure that that is protected is by holding their vendors, holding their suppliers to a really high standard. And I wasn't as familiar with it in 2014. And I don't think many SaaS companies were as familiar with the, the world of compliance in 2014. But much later, I, I heard a, a great phrase from Larkin Ryder, who Slack hired to run risk and compliance much later. And she says, compliance is how you get credit for good security. Now companies are almost pre-product are starting to do SOC 2 audits and things like that because even their design partners, even their very first customers are holding them to a standard of security that maybe they're meeting and certainly the compliance criteria help them do an even better job, but they need to prove it. And so, so companies are starting these programs earlier and earlier and looking more and more like deer in headlights as they approach that before they've even really got anything to sell. I've, I've seen those deer in headlights and it's, we've just gotten a very long form to fill out. And you, how do you think about when a founder or an early team member that says, hey, I've really got to formalize my operations now. We've, we've kind of gotten our app into the market and it is uh, starting to grow and we're getting all these questions. What, what's the first thing that you want to focus on? I know that's a a bit of a general question, but really there's so many different things that you could focus on first. How do you advise someone like that? Well, the first thing that's, that's usually a formality, but the first thought that a company really has to have is that they have to actually care about providing a secure product. They have to actually care about protecting their customers' data, their confidentiality, the availability, which it's, it's a weird thing to think about availability as a security concern. But if you rely on Slack or Zoom or Notion or anything else to get your work done and that product is unavailable, it's as if that data has been deleted temporarily and, and it will come back, but that's a significant blow to your business. And so security encompasses availability as well. And all of that together means you have to you have to begin with the the desire to to meet those challenges and and companies can get a long long way by actually meeting those challenges and talking with their customers about how they do and developing a rapport in the in the in the way that having a contract is more of a formality if the people that you have that contract with are people you trust uh, so if you're able to develop a rapport with a customer that they trust your practices. They trust that your incentives are aligned. They trust that you're doing your very best work and that you're very competent. Then the compliance is more of a formality, but that's not scalable. And so that's what a lot of companies deal with is not the, they don't need the compliance frameworks to create security. They need the compliance frameworks to scale their credibility. And that's very interesting. Is scaling There's a progression. The credibility leads to trust and trust is how you grow with your early customers. And it's really the underlying uh, theme around bootstrapping your compliance is communicate, build trust and, and find the points in your customers value that they're getting from your service to, to make sure that you deliver on that. It's all about delivering every time. Right. And so your, your early customers, they're going to send you their, their oppressively long spreadsheets with questions about how you approach security, how you handle their data, how your employees are given access and how that's controlled. And, and they're all super reasonable questions, usually written in a very uh, opaque to software engineers and product managers kind of language. But there's good advice hiding in there. There's always... There's always good advice hiding under the, the compliance criteria, under the InfoSec questionnaires. And the first step with a lot of companies is usually you just get really good at answering those. And the next step is usually you fill out sort of a standardized version of that. And then you, you send that to customers in hopes that you don't have to go through by hand and fill out every one of them. You almost take a defense and you flip it into offense 
and let them mm -hmm. know that you're thinking about those things and you have almost a living document that you use to uh, fulfill those requests. So mm -hmm. instead of them sending you a form, you're sending them your form showing that you're proactive around compliance and making sure you deliver. And you're hopefully saving yourself a lot of time, which can can shorten your sales cycle and, and Indeed. actually be a, a, a difference maker for a small company. And then eventually you still have to, to grapple with the fact that those questionnaires, whoever's writing them, however scalable they are, are a matter of trust. The customer has to trust that those answers are real and that you're doing what you say you do. And that is where auditors come in. Their whole purpose is to have a a an established reputation for integrity that if the auditor vouches for you, then you're worth being vouched for. And when you send something to a, a customer from a, a trustworthy auditor, that is, that is a way to bootstrap the, the trust that that customer needs in you and how you're handling their data. And that's ultimately what compliance programs are, are getting you is, is a sort of a third party unaffiliated at a station that you're doing what you say you do. You're being a good shepherd of that customer's data. Which leads me to another topic that's adjacent to this one. How do you think about building out a team? You joined sub 20 people at Slack. How many people were there when you left? I think around 2,200. Wow. But just like if you if you put enough servers together, you forget exactly how many you have. You put enough coworkers together, and you you forget how many you have. You, and it was a different yeah. company then because you at twenty two hundred people, you can't do anything alone. There are experts in every part of launching a product that are better at the parts that you would have been moonlighting in at twenty or thirty employees. And so launching new things involves, involves marketing, involves design, involves product management, involves customer experience agents, involves sales enablement. And all of those things had always been happening. We were doing all of those things when we were 30 people. It was just, it was me telling the one salesperson about it. And I'm not as good at that. So as we've grown up, people specialize and get better at those parts of the whole process of delivering some value to a customer. You, you kind of got right to where I was going. I see this a lot with companies, especially when they start hitting uh, 100 people, 200 people, 500 people. They start to specialize and they're able to attract talent that is the expert. How did you think about that on your team? How do you keep everybody in sync? And, and what do you look for when you, when you kind of think about specializing versus being a generalist? I always preferred to hire generalists if we're, if we're going to put people in, in sort of two buckets. And in operations engineering, I was always looking for folks who are either uh, sysadmins who have evolved into writing programs and thinking about things like testing and software architecture, or I'm hiring software engineers who were trained in all of that stuff in school or on the job or whatever, who have through curiosity or need or both learn to operate their own software on the internet. And you need both to, to operate modern websites because while there's definite specialization between different disciplines of engineering, they're blurrier than they were before. And being able to meet folks in the middle is hugely important. Understanding if you're operating a giant tier of web servers how that web application works is crucial. It's not a black box. And if you treat it as a black box, you're leaving a lot on the table. So the more folks understand how the system works, the better results you'll get from your team as you're building it. So it's building yeah. a, a general shared model in everybody's heads around the system. What does that look like in practice? And and we can pick any point at, at along the journey as possible, but how did you organize the teams to do that? Like if I'm a founder sitting there going, I'm going from 20 to 40 people, what's one thing that I could implement to, to at least start that process? Well, as, as an application gets larger, as a team gets larger, as a product gets larger, you'll inevitably have everybody come up against that wall where they can't keep the whole system in their heads anymore. And, and everybody hits that at, 
slightly different, but like kind of the same time. And you end up needing to create teams to, I hesitate to use the word specialization because it's more like areas of responsibility. Okay. And, and as we grew and hit that wall, I created areas of responsibility that focused some engineers on storage databases, things like that. Some engineers on what we called app ops, some engineers on build and release and, and developer tooling and, and things like that. And that was necessary because it, it created these smaller domains of responsibility that had still the, the generalist mentality of understanding more of the stack being flexible in how they built software and, and what kinds of things they were capable of, of attacking, but could sort of abstract away other parts of the, the universe. So for instance, one of the other teams that we created was the visibility team and their customers were all internal. They were building and maintaining the infrastructure we used to monitor and observe and understand what was happening in production. And with only internal customers, they, they sort of were, were resolved of having to think about database replication in the production web app or, or what it's like to deploy the, the PHP application. And that, that created focus for them. And they still went up and down the stack. They still had a lot of generalist-like responsibilities, but they had a, a narrower domain that they could keep in their head. And that, that was important. The downside of that, a place that I feel like I sincerely failed is that this, this breakdown of, of teams left this, this one called AppOps that was responsible for web servers and, and, and web socket systems and real-time stuff and CDNs. It, like you already see from this list, it, it became an everything bucket. And I don't, I, I don't know how I would have organized things differently to not create an everything bucket. Somehow the breakdown was going to, was going to let something fall through the cracks. And it, it just, the gravity pulled it all to this app ops team. And, and I failed to protect them. I failed to give them a clear enough mandate that their scope was constrained. It was ever growing. We would invent more things and it just inevitably always fell to the app ops team. And so that was, that was the one that had the most trouble keeping that area of responsibility small and understandable and was the most ultimately in need of splitting up into yet more teams later. So I don't, I don't know if this has changed since I left Slack, but the storage engine team, for instance, was largely the way it was conceived, but AppOps had split into several other teams over time that further specialized into, into different areas of responsibility. And I bet there's still an everything bucket, even with those smaller profiles of what folks are responsible for, I bet there is still an everything bucket that is the, the team where, where stuff that doesn't make sense lands. And that mentality is something that I see the appeal and, and drive of the, of the you own it, you operate it kind of team structure because someone built that software and they're probably in the best position to run it. And so in the second chapter of my time at Slack, when I left management and became an engineer on that same team, the leadership in place started to, to embed operations engineers, SREs, whichever you like to call them. We called them SREs at Slack. We started to embed them in different product engineering teams. And so the, the Slack enterprise product team had SREs. The, the Slack search infrastructure team had SREs associated with them. And that was a way to avoid the everything bucket because those operational concerns weren't falling back into some centralized team that was oversubscribed anymore. Can we talk about that for a minute? Because it's something that I see happening more and more with different functions. And you have um, an operations engineer, you have sometimes a security engineer, and, and they're being embedded in the team. What do you think the pros and cons are, at, I mean, early on? right? We're thinking about sub 20 person companies, 20, 30 people. Would you recommend doing that at that stage? Or is that something that's best left for scale? What was your experience with, with embedding operations inside of the product teams? I don't have a, a cut and dry answer, but I think that 
the benefits of those centralized teams are in providing infrastructure, platforms, tools that many teams can use. There's a, a, a network effect, a benefit of reuse that's realized when you have many teams consuming the same thing. And if you're building that kind of infrastructure, it, it is potentially way more cost effective for many of your teams within your company to be using it. At the extreme small end of the spectrum of companies, though, most of those things that are being built are being shared are probably just AWS products or, or similar. And, and I think running a long way with that, with every team having some responsibility for what AWS resources they're using and how, how they're architecting their systems puts you in a decent position to, to keep teams orthogonal from each other. They're not blocked on, on some centralized function. Right. Uh, but that eventually can, can put you in a position where no one's getting any economies of scale. No one's getting any benefits from any shared infrastructure. So it requires a, a, a deft hand and probably a good bit of luck to recognize when there is, is common ground and move in that direction. Uh, I don't know that I could ever, you know, stick that landing a high percentage of the time. Yeah. But as you much as you become much bigger, the off the shelf stuff becomes slightly less perfect for you and the the benefits of taking control and sharing those wins become much greater. I think that that makes sense to me. It's it's looking at it as a balance. Right? You mm -hmm. can centralize things, you can distribute responsibilities. Um and functions, but if you do one or the other, uh, you just have to be very in control of your dials and yeah. make sure that whatever your needs are, your org structure is serving. That I hear left. It's, it's a it's at this point almost a punchline that doesn't need a buildup uh, of a startup who wastes an inordinate amount of time running a bunch of very high end, very high scale ready cloud infrastructure whether kubernetes or not so it's usually kubernetes Amen. and that and Amen. that that looks to me like a huge distraction from finding product market fit from building something that that speaks to people and and the truth of the matter is that like a, a monolithic application can get you a long long way and then and then you have a replatforming task if you are so lucky as to outgrow that then you have a replatforming task. But one of the I things think. that I learned at Slack is that even an infrastructure change that looks like it's sort of an abstraction beneath is an application level change, is a replatforming change that deserves all of the rigor and all of the caution and all of the consideration of cost benefit that you would do for any significant change. So even moving a workload from EC2 to GCE which we tried to do at Slack because Google had some, some regions, some geographic regions that were advantageous. We found that those two nominally Linux as a service offerings are not at all the same and running the same code the same way in both of them does not yield the same results. So it didn't matter that the application ran, it didn't run the same way and that that ended up being a, a costly lesson. That's uh, hard earned uh, learnings there. Switching gears for a minute, what was what advice would you give yourself on that day one, knowing what you know now, having ridden that incredible ride uh, at scale, <laughs> where does your mind go first? Well, I think knowing what I know now, I would not have become a, interested in the management career path. Uh, at my company before Slack, I started to manage a very small team and I continued that at Slack. And the reason that I went down that path was that I saw how much more a team got done than an individual. And that, that satisfaction of the larger accomplishment was really intoxicating. The reality though, is that my skills and my interests are not aligned with the job of management. They're closer to uh, leadership and influence and a job that I wish that I really understood before Slack Architect. I, I sort of thought that that was just a fancy job title you gave senior engineers to make them happy. 
But if I had paid any attention to the larger Yahoo while I worked at Flickr, I think what I would have realized is that that's the sort of position where you're expected to lead, but only through influence and that you are a supporter of other people's careers, but you're not on the hook for performance management and things like that. And that turned out to be the, the job that I ultimately wanted. So that was a lesson that took a long time to learn and a, and a lot of struggle to learn. But that's the first thing that I would have done is set myself up as someone who's there to lead through influence over technology and architecture and not be responsible for and yet in over my head about other folks' careers. They deserve better than that. And the other thing that I think is a, a theme that I would do very differently now at Slack is that there were a number of areas where I feel like we should have, I should have embraced many things that you might call cloud native earlier, uh, direct use of S3 instead of local disks, uh, auto scaling instead of our bespoke provisioning tools, even a, a greater embrace of SaaS monitoring and, and developer productivity kinds of tools. I personally regret dragging my feet on the adoption of Honeycomb out of largely fear that if it was broken, we would be flying blind and we couldn't fix it ourselves. Uh, and similarly, I, we over the years had a lot of struggles with our excessively large, excessively busy web app repository on GitHub Enterprise. And it honestly would have, I think, been worthwhile to let GitHub operate that for us and accept that that meant we would probably use our emergency deployment path more often. There are a lot more nuances to that about subprocessors and control of data and, and security and whatnot, but there's also a lot to be said for having the expert authors of systems operating those systems on your behalf. So that's something that fortunately, for, for example, in the Honeycomb case, they've started to use Honeycomb to really great effect in the last year or two. And that's been wonderful to see, but we could have been doing it for a lot longer. Just so I make sure I, I grok that right. Cause I think that's a huge point going back and looking at the options you had to bring in external third party solutions for certain components. There was an aversion to that because if it went down, you would not be able to kind of grab the wheel and you'd be flying blind without Honeycomb. So for example, with, with GitHub Enterprise and GitHub.com, there's a way to deploy Slack that doesn't involve that repository. There's a, a much simpler flow that doesn't support all the pull requests and issues and things like that, Got but it. nonetheless can deploy the site. It's tougher to imagine a, a failover for some data centric thing like monitoring, but for, for anything that's off of the customer critical path, I think it's worth considering SaaS and even certain things that are on the customer critical path for companies starting out now, it's, it's really a good idea to consider. So in, in Bold Start's domain, you invest in companies that are, that are selling to the enterprise. And so the idea that you're going to avoid integration with identity providers and things like that is, is farcical anyway. So there's a lot to be said about going ahead and fully embracing those partners, those dependencies in your application and, and acknowledging and controlling it rather than trying to avoid it. That's great advice. And I tell our founders that if you think you're going to get out of this without integrations, you're mistaken. Mm -hmm. But the founders that I've seen with a little bit more muscle and experience in the space usually look at those as revenue opportunities. And they look at it as a way to really build that trust with the customer, understand their mm -hmm. systems, understand what screens are sitting next to yours in a workflow. So that kind of segues nicely into uh, last bucket, which is ops and DevOps are notoriously hard to sell to. Um, there's and I'm a, part of the problem. Well, how do you think about external versus internal tooling? And I think we touched on what you would have done differently. Mm -hmm. um, what advice would you give a founder that is going in to sell to ops or trying to get ops to adopt their product? 
is there anything that jumps out as if I'm going to start talking to you about my tool? Mm -hmm. What would you say? What would you advise that I never, ever say? What, what would be the, the two seconds of wisdom that you can share? I think the, the way that Slack always talked about Slack's product to customers, uh, asserting that we were better at operating Slack in the cloud than they would be on a rack in their closet, uh, holds a bit of water, but it's sort of, it, it's not convincing. It's true. It's not convincing. Hmm. And I think, I think especially when you're selling to engineering teams, when you're selling to people who have service level objectives and even service level agreements on their minds, the, the way that we used to talk about this, this binary, like it's either on-prem or it's in the cloud, isn't true anymore. And acknowledging that. that there's a huge gray scale between those ends I think is, is probably the best strategy for companies to think about what they offer and to frame how they talk about it with customers. Now, with so many people running in major cloud providers and the networking and isolation features available there making it possible, there are lots of points along this spectrum of semi-private operated or on-prem-ish bits of software that are actually pretty compelling. For example, if I'm hosted in AWS and, and you offer a product that is or can be hosted in AWS, then you could be offering it to me. First of all, you could be offering it to me more cheaply because we could make private network connectivity happen. And that that's actually just a straight up cost saving opportunity, which, which folks should absolutely take advantage of. Got but it. more importantly, we can talk about how you have the ability to separate the capacity that serves me from the capacity that serves other folks and protect me from your other customers, protect your other customers from me. And the fact that you can just offer SaaS that's not one big multi-tenant system is already a pretty compelling thing. It, there are significant security wins to that. There are potentially significant availability wins to that. Maybe there aren't. Maybe I'm the problem customer who's causing all the availability problems. And so I still don't have a good experience, but everybody else does. And that's, that's good for that company and all those other customers that they're isolated from me. Um, there also then is the opportunity to control a different safety factor, which is, is the velocity of change. And, and it, takes a, it takes a deft hand here as well to balance velocity with safety and early stage companies are going to want to prefer velocity, rightly so. And later stage companies or perhaps more risk averse customers are going to drive a focus on safety. And a startup who's deploying this sort of isolated infrastructure that, that's somewhere in between traditional multi-tenant SaaS and on-prem has the opportunity to control that a little bit too and, and offer, offer folks a, a more confident SLA knowing that they're, they're vetting this software, they're releasing it slowly, they're in control, not deploying to every customer at once can be a win. Got it. Uh, that it might be unfair if you always deployed in alphabetical order. And so Z got a really good experience and A always got the, the, the riskiest behavior. But if you stagger, if you have single tenant environments or, or a more cellular architecture, it doesn't even have to be single tenant, then you can spread that risk and, and protect most people most of the time from the riskiest part of your deployment, which is usually the beginning. I know the founders of Replicator think a lot about uh, what does the future look like? Well, it's, it's a hybrid and mm -hmm. it's going to be dependent on the customer's needs, but it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be either or. It doesn't have to be my machines or your machines. It can sure. be a balance and on a spectrum. And replicated is even further toward that on-prem end, end of the spectrum. It's, it's like a more modern standardization of what to expect when you package some on-prem software. And that's, that's valuable too, because it creates, it, it's a more likely to succeed because it's a more robust and standardized and observable platform. That's super valuable, especially relative to like shipping a binary in a tarball and hoping for the best. And that architecture will will help you get that that next 
tranche of customers that after you're doing something single tenant, there's still going to be customers who are wary of being on the internet, wary of the public cloud, wary of access even by their employees from places that aren't the office. And so that next level of control is, well, okay, if you run your own data center, if you can, you can meet us in this sort of cloud-like operational environment, then we can use Replicated to deliver that to you. But for the vast majority of folks, you can sort of, you can be closer to the SaaS end of the spectrum and you can be doing more of that operation live for them on the internet, supporting it in a way that you perhaps can't in a disconnected VPN only paranoid corporate environment. Absolutely. I think that's, is that a technical term, a paranoid corporate environment? I'm not sure I'd call it a technical term, but I definitely, I definitely use paranoid as a, a shorthand for, for a level of security conscious that's truly above and beyond that they've thought of every contingency that they, in most cases, actually totally rationally feel that those are more likely in their environment for whatever reason. You know, I've had customers talk about uh, corporate espionage in a way that you can tell they've seen some things. Got it. And that's not the world that I inhabit. So when I'm talking to customers, I have to try to understand what risks they're actually trying to address. I think that's that's the soundbite I want to just pause that section on because it's perfect. It's It's what risks are your customers trying to address? And it goes all the way back to building trust, as we talked about in the beginning of our conversation. So, Rich, I, I appreciate all the, the wisdom you shared in the time you've given us today. I, we like to do one thing at the end of these talks, which is kind of like a free association. So I did some homework <laughs> and I went back through a lot of your old posts and tweets and I found one uh, particular graphic that I thought I'd just share with you <laughs> in the hopes that it might spark a memory or a fun story that you could share with us. And if not, just be like, cut this out of the video. But um, <laughs> it, it is now one of the backgrounds on my monitor because it's so great. So if I can just show you this and ask you, what comes to mind when you when you see this graphic? Well, I'm pretty sure that I saw that sticker first via John Allspaugh and in the long, long ago. And it, it certainly reminds me of, of a couple of stories. So throughout my time at Slack, I was always, though, you know, sometimes less visibly a champion of getting more engineers to be on call, supporting the software that they wrote, the features that they built. And, and early, early in that, that battle, I would have conversations with folks about monitoring and what represented problematic situations for the services that they had built and, and a team really wanted alerts on CPU usage on EC2 instances that were running their software. And my, my refrain was always using CPU is not a crime. And it took time. It took a lot of patience and, and baby steps, but we worked toward a world where we alerted on customers actually experiencing problems. Wow. Not being able to hold on to WebSocket connections, not being able to send messages, things like that, as opposed to alerting on resource usage. Because right. another way to look at a, an, an alert wow. that says you're using 85% of your CPU, another way to look at that is you're really getting your money's worth out of that server. Yes. So we'd look at these graphs and, and we'd try to compare CPU usage to message sends to connections, to connection failures and things like that, and try to find the, the real problem. And, and perhaps those CPU alerts were useful and diagnostic. And so what we would often do would, would be to either put the two graphs next to each other, the symptom that we alerted on the, and the physical resource that we thought it was driving, or we would, we would pipe into an alerts channel. We would say, well, here's an alert that we, we've shed a bunch of WebSocket connections or, or we're, we're having more than zero connection failures. And then, and we page someone about that, but we'd also pop into that alert channel and say, PS, CPU usage is 85%. We would never page anybody about that anymore, but we put that context in place because it was useful for orienting yourself into what kind of situation you were entering as that on-call engineer. And that was actually... That, that was an instance of a, a broader pattern about Slack that I, I like to point out is that Slack as an interface is messaging and 
that is often not the right medium for acting on information, for doing some action, but it is almost always the best way to be told some action is necessary within your company, that the transparency and context of something's happening that needs your attention, something's happened that causes a discussion, like that's all super valuable, but clicking out to another website to take action to understand, you know, we would go look at graphs in Graphite, we'd go look at logs. We didn't do that in Slack, but we were given that context in Slack and that was hugely valuable. Context is valuable. Richard, if people want to follow you, where should they go? They can follow me on Twitter as R Crowley. And, and if you got time for a bonus, I've got one more charts and graphs story for you. Oh, I would love one more charts and graphs story. <laughs> so, so I had this, this useless party trick at Slack in the early days. And I think until very, very recently, I've heard that, that a long migration has completed. We ran MySQL in master, master replication. And this was, and we had dozens or so of these pairs when I started and we had thousands by the time we ultimately migrated off to an architecture based on Vitesse, which a whole great team of engineers have, has run and built. But in the master master days, the point of, of that using that replication architecture was to always be able to accept writes. That if you couldn't get to one side, you'd use the other. And we used a lot of SQL statements like insert on duplicate key update to make that safe. And it was still not safe to a database aficionado, but it was operable. It was reasonable. And, uh, and the, the, the party trick is that sometimes we would have significant delays in replication from one side to the other, where one side would take a ton of traffic, a ton of writes all at once, and then it would take a while to replicate. And knowing how MySQL replication works, what I would do is I'd go I'd do a little bit of math, and then I'd say, everybody be calm it's going to recover at 617 and it would keep climbing. It would look bad, but like clockwork, it drops, recovers, and everything is fine at 617. And that dumb little party trick always got lots of amusement and always gave an opportunity to teach some folks that had either not gone deep with MySQL before or not really learned about database architectures to always uh, to learn a little bit about how the system really worked. And so that was always a fun icebreaker. That's a great icebreaker. And, and less, I mean, a great party trick, but I'm sure also a great way to train new folks as they get on board about the system just a little mm -hmm. bit. So finding those opportunities in your own organization to teach people how the system works in areas that they may not experience every day is an art form. And I think we got a little taste of it here today and, and I really appreciate it, Richard. Thanks. Always fun. Thank you. I have to go look up about three things that we talked about, but at the end of the day, I always have to when I talk to you, and that's my favorite part. Thanks for the time. Wow. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Elliot. <laughs>